just kind of telling a couple ladies that God put it on my heart a couple years ago to start doing women's retreats in my home and really focusing on 12 women at a time, just ministering one-on-one -on -one with these women. And so it starts at 9 in the morning, it goes till 9 at night, and we eat together, we craft together, we sing together, we swim together. It's a lot of fun. And, um, we have teaching sessions and, and some small group sessions. You really love it. So keep an eye out on our website for our next couple of retreats coming up. But tonight I want to talk about reckless faith. Who could use a little message on some reckless faith, all right? So we're going to be in, um, we're going we're gonna to talk about Peter here. And we're gonna, you know the story, y'all, it's when Jesus walks on the water, right? And then Peter walks on the water. But we're going to dig in tonight for some Bible study in one of the Gospels. How do you like that, ladies, right? <laughs> all right, so I think it's Matthew word, okay? But I'm going to just read it to you. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went onto a mountainside by himself to pray. Aren't we so thankful for that, ladies? Aren't we so thankful that he got along with the Father to pray? We need to do that as well. Amen? Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And he began to sink. Cried out, Lord, save me! Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for walking on water for us. God, help us to develop the reckless kind of faith that says, tell me to come to you, Lord, and walk on the water towards him. Lord, I pray this for everyone in this room, to develop that kind of faith that Peter had, that reckless kind of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to do a little Bible study now, ladies, because we all need some Bible study, right? So we're going to dig into this. And I want to say, first of all, we as humans can make a God moment turn into a fear moment so quick, can't we? We complicate things. Seeing Jesus walking on the water was the last thing that they considered to be happening. They thought he was a ghost. Fear has a way of trying to steal God's thunder so many times in this world. So many times in the Old Testament and the New Testament. When the angel of the Lord or God was appearing to someone to comfort them or to anoint them or to bless them, the first thing that they would have to say is, fear not. Fear not. We read it in Genesis when we see Hagar. She's by herself, in the, by herself in the wilderness, and she's scared, and she's alone with Ishmael. And God shows up in Genesis 21, 17. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. It says in Luke 2, 10, and the angel said to them, Fear not. For behold, this is not him talking to Mary. This is him talking to 
the shepherds. But he says it to Mary, too. You guys aren't just so glad you showed up tonight. Okay, in Revelation, John gets a vision of the Lord. In Revelation 1.17, it says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. You better believe that the human mind has a difficult time conceiving the supernatural, y'all. The supernatural presence of God kicks our fight or flight hormone into full swing, right? Into full swing. And God knows that about us. He knows that because he made us. And he has to use the first two words usually when he shows up on the scene. Fear not. Or Take courage, right? Because this is what he had to say to them, because they were like, it's a ghost. Peter needed to know it was him before he even walked on the water. Peter saw him walk towards him. He saw him. He heard him. He said, he heard him say, take courage in his eye, but he still had to ask, Lord, if it's you, right? If it's you, tell me to come to you. Can anyone relate to that? Right? I think we all can. You knew God was in a situation. You knew it was him leading you or calling you in something. But, and he pretty much told you, you know, you have a choice to make. But listen, I'm already going to tell you what choice to make. You know it was God, but you still need a little nudge, right? To know you're in his will. I know I have had this. I know so many times. I know some of you know that, that if you were here a couple months ago, God called Tommy and I to sell our house and move to a new home. And we knew, I knew in my knower, you know your knower, right? I knew in my knower it was not me, it was God. It was not me, it was God. But guess what? I pulled a Peter, God, if this is you, I probably said it 80 billion times to him through that. God, if this is not you, slam the door. If this is you, I'll walk through it. If this is you, and I'm telling you, it was right down to the last second when when the, the realtor representing this other house calls my husband and says, it's between you and another person. I went right out to pray, right? And I was like, Lord, show me a dragonfly, okay? I wanted some signs. I was like, no, 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 no. I see that, but show me a purple dragonfly, right? I needed specifics. Land on this sign, Lord. And, and it was like, I was like, Mo, you're going to have to just trust me. They didn't even call him the son of God until he walked on water. These disciples, these disciples, keep in mind, they just saw him. When it says then, he sent them into the lake. Then came right after something. It was when he had just fed 5,000 people with the amount of food in a little boy's lunchbox. But they still were afraid. And Peter still needed more nudging. We need proof. We need evidence. A clear and concise design of God's will, plans, and expectations of us should we decide to follow. We need confirmation, support groups. We need angelic visitations, miracles, and then we still only follow for a little while until God does it again. When we aren't looking for Jesus in everything, we call it ghosts or coincidences or good luck, right? For some reason, we're more comfortable with the common than the holy. We're far more apt to call the holy common out of fear. In Ezekiel 44, 23, God says, They are to teach my people the difference between the holy and the common and show them how to distinguish between the unclean and the clean. God has anointed and blessed the holy, set it apart, and, but as humans, we allow fear to kill that glory over and over. When what God truly requires of us is childlike, reckless faith. Childlike faith is God's desire for us. 
He said that if you don't accept the kingdom like a little child, in Mark 10, 15, it says, Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. He wants us like children. He had just fed 5,000. They had seen him turn water into wine. He had been with them, preached to them, done miracles in front of them. They were witnessing glory after glory after glory, and they still had to see Jesus walk on water. And Peter walked to him, and then Peter doubt, and Peter fall in, and Jesus scoop him up. They had to see all of this. And then have both of them climb into the boat for the ones in the boat to say, Surely, you're the Son of God. It took a lot, y'all. When we look at the winds and the waves in our lives, fear creeps in so quickly. And we get swept up in it again until our Jesus says, Mo, of little faith, why do you doubt? Do you do that, y'all? Do you put your name in? Do you put your name in the scriptures where God's talking to the disciples? Because you really should. Insert your name where Jesus talks to them because he's talking to us. Because when we do that, it personalizes us and it makes it real. To hear God say, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things. That's convicting, right? But... When you hear, Mo, oh, oh, you are worried and about many things. That one is ouch, y'all. Yeah. Ouch, the conviction. Personalization increases our realization of the scriptures. You of little faith stings, but Mo of little faith. That one makes me want to grow. That one wakes me up. That one puts me on the water with Peter. That one makes me wonder if I would think it was a ghost or it was God. The key to keeping our spiritual footing on the top of the water instead of sinking into the water of doubt is to keep our eyes on Jesus. When Peter was looking at Jesus, he was walking. He was safe. He was on top of the water. But when he saw the wind and became afraid, he began to sink. And he had to cry out to Jesus for help. My friend Jody wrote me a note one time. Jody and I worked with each other at a church one time for about six years, and our offices were right next to each other. And I'm telling you, I loved sharing an office with the being right next to her because on a tough day I would come in and plop on her couch and and she was a doctor in psychology. Let me tell you about how good God is when you're burning out. Have a doctor of psychology be in the chair right next to you. I just would plop in and talk to her. I was so thankful when Jody was moving with her family. She wrote me a note and it said, "I love your reckless faith." At first, the devil said to me. She thinks you don't make good choices. Then God spoke to my heart and showed me we are supposed to have a little reckless faith. Not faith that needs to check and check and check before we step. Jesus wants us to step out in faith and then trust that he has us like a little child trusts a parent. Amen. All Peter had to do was zoom in on Jesus. That's all he had to do was keep his eyes on Jesus. All he had to do was fix his eyes on the author and the perfecter of our faith. All he had to do was stare. As long as we stare, we don't sink. In a world of, if it's going to be, it's up to me, psychology, reckless, childlike faith is something we have to pursue at all costs. Some of us doers, have to actively pursue being still and knowing he's God. One morning on our family vacation, Tommy and I went for a walk. We call it a hike if it's under. Okay, right? That's what it is. Hiking is under, Sam. That's what I say, right? And if it's uphill, it's really a hike, okay? 
So we hiked up this pretty steep, couple steep hills, and um, as we were coming down the hill, it was all rocks, and um, you could hear us like walking. It was so quiet. We could hear our feet on the rocks, and we were paced at the same pace. And Tommy said to me, I was pacing my footsteps with you so you don't have to rush. And first of all, I thought, that's my sweet Tommy, right? He's my sweet Tommy. doesn't want me to trip because he's seen me trip. You guys have heard the story. <laughs> but then I thought to myself, this is exactly what I used to do. God took me right there. This is what I used to do when I was a little child. I would climb up on the couch with my dad, and my dad would be watching TV, and I would lay my head on his chest and hear his heartbeat, and I would try to get my heartbeat to do what his did. I tried to pace my breathing with his. God wants us to do that with him. As our daddy, he wants us to be still and slow our pace to match the pace he's setting, or to step it up and follow him in the pace he's, ste he's stepping. He wants us to get out of our fears and take the steps he's calling us to take with our lives. The word talks about keeping in step with the Spirit. We do that by intimately trusting our Heavenly Daddy and having childlike, reckless, sometimes faith. We can't be wishy-washy and double-minded. Double-mindedness made Peter sink. A questioning spirit of doubt creeped in the, and the water walking Peter. He went down, right? That questioning spirit of doubt comes. And the word in James says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person, person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Sisters, when we ask our daddy for anything, we need to remember he wants us to ask us and not doubt. Not doubt. Double-mindedness shows us our difficulty in separating the common and the holy. God is holy. He's perfect. If he says walk, if he says to come to him on the waters, we have to trust and we have to step out and not doubt. Just step and step and step and then step and stare and step and stare. Sometimes we have to step and stare and step and stare and say, shut up, Satan. Step and stare and shut up. That is walking it out with him. Romans 12, 11 says, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Here's a silly example of what I mean by step and stare and shut up. Come on, y'all. This is what we have to do every day. We have to shut the devil up in his ugly questioning spirits. I don't know about any of you, but I think that there's something very encouraging about Facebook when it's your birthday, right? There's like two times when Facebook is really nice. It's your birthday and like an anniversary, right? When someone wants to wish you a happy anniversary or a happy birthday. On your birthday on Facebook, people say the nicest things to you. They do. They do little like tributes to you, they put pictures. It is a beautiful time to use your encouraging words to love on people. And I think people are more comfortable typing than saying it with their mouth, right? So people want to show their love. On your birthday, it can make you feel so loved. And, and you go to bed and you thank God, and you're like, God, I feel so loved today. Thank you. Thank you for all of these amazing relationships and friendships. And I know a lot of those people don't really know me. They just say happy birthday. But it does make you feel good, doesn't it? Yeah. It does. And you go to bed on your birthday night feeling so loved, and then the next morning you get up, and that devil makes a bid for your thoughts. Because he whispers in your ear that one person that didn't say happy birthday. Oh, so-and-so didn't say happy birthday to you. Hmm. 
wow, she hasn't posted on your page in a long time. She hasn't even liked anything that you've, you've written. You must have definitely done something to offend her, right? Come on, y'all. Anybody else? <laughs> that devil's attempting to steal God's blessings immediately from you. He's trying to get you underwater again. Underwater in insecurity. Underwater in fear. Underwater in doubt and guilt and in shame. Fix your eyes. Fix your eyes, y'all. Fix our eyes. We have to fix our eyes on Jesus. And this is when we have to say, shut up, devil. We have to step out and stare and shut up the doubt. We can't be swayed from the path God has us on by being tossed to and fro by every wind and wave of life. We have to actively choose to keep our footing. We have to choose our footing on the water by keeping our eyes on Jesus all the time. Reckless, childlike faith is God's desire for us. He's our daddy. He wants to bless us. He wants to love us. He wants us to trust him and not fear. He wants us to climb on his lap and lay our heads on his chest and match our breath to his. Just like we desire our kids to feel safe and secure in our arms, no matter what, our God wants our childlike faith to be just like that with Him. 2 Corinthians 6.18 says, I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Do we forget our daddy is God? Matthew 6.9 says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Reckless faith is faith in the fact that no matter what happens, no matter what happens, we know our daddy has us. That song, that reckless love song, that one gets me every time. When, when he, he is there to, I love it when it says to whatever, every lie, what do they say? Like, like, it's like he's there to try to be like, you're believing lies. He doesn't want us believing lies. He'll climb any mountain. He'll, be, he'll go to every dark place in our lives. He wants us to believe truths. On our way back from Georgia yesterday, we wanted to do one more fun thing. You know, you don't want the vacation to end. We're like, one more fun thing. Come on, right? So we had a full day. and We didn't really have to be home until like midnight to get up for work and stuff. So we're like, okay. So on our way back, we thought, well, Tommy goes, just, just let's just do something on the way home, right? Don't take me off to the east or west two more hours, right? Like if we figure out what we're doing, let's just make it fun on the way home. So we're driving and... And Sarah, Sarah's looking up. First of all, I, I don't know about any of y'all, but the best part of family vacation for me was I had all my kids under one roof for four nights, okay? That was heaven for me. That was heaven. I got to wake up and have coffee with my kids again. It was just like such a great thing. Um, you don't realize you want it so bad till they're all moved out and got their own houses, right? And their own families. You're just like, I just want to see you in your jammies. That's all you want, right? So, so we're in the car and we're driving back. And um, so I said, what about Six Flags? Okay, so I, this, we were like, I go, why don't we go to Six Flags over Georgia? Because it's in Atlanta and it's on the way. And, and so Sarah's like, it's 30 minutes from here. Right, we started getting excited. So we, Sarah goes, Mom, these are like, only, you can get a ticket for $30 for the whole day, $30. We're like, that's not really bad, right? I haven't been to a theme park in so long now. Okay, so, so, so long, because I my kids are big now, and we don't do Disney anymore. We'll probably have to do that again with grandbabies. But I said, let's go. Tommy loves roller coasters, so let's go to Six Flags, because I knew he'd say yes to that one. Okay, so Tommy's like, 30 minutes. Sarah, $30. Okay, we're going, right? So we got so excited. We got spontaneous, right? We made the decision as we were pulling into Atlanta. We're going. So this was not something that me and Tommy do, right? You know me, you guys. I'm like, I like a plan. I like a three-point plan on how to fix everybody's lives. That's my, that is me, okay? But I was like, and this is, we're like, we're just going to go to Six Flags today. Eli, if you do any of those Enneagram things, anybody ever know those, like, personality tests? Eli, his, his is just called fun. All right, that is the baby of the family. Anything fun seems fun. Let's just do that. He eats Funyuns. He likes fun dip. That is like anything fun sounds like you like, okay? So he was all in. As we're, we're all walking in fast from the 
parking lot to go to Six Flags. Sarah goes, Mom, a half hour, we didn't even know we were going to a theme park. I go, no, we didn't, but we're going to a theme park, right? So we're walking in, and Eli goes, I just gotta ask, did you and Dad just become cool? <laughs> and I was like, yes, I'm gonna be the cool mom for five minutes. I was so excited. So we made the decision to go in. We were like, okay. But I know Six Flags is roller coasters, right? Well, when I was younger, roller coasters didn't hurt. But when you get older, roller coasters hurt. I'm sorry. So I knew if I was going to hold on with these youngsters and go on these roller coasters, it was going to take prayer. OK? So I have a really weak neck. I do. It's skinny, and it's weak, and it does whatever it wants to, whatever it wants to, OK? And if you know, don't know anything about the human head, it's very heavy. So when your neck hurts, your head feels very heavy. So. So every roller coaster we went on, all I did was close my eyes and pray. I prayed. I prayed. And these are the things I would pray. I'd say, Lord, you know I want to bless my kids, so God, please help me to hold my neck in one spot. When it jerks, please hold my neck back or leave me go, Lord. Please just be in you. Oh, God, hold my neck. Right? So I'm being quiet, quiet, quiet. And we would get off the first one, and I was like, my neck didn't hurt. Okay. And then they're like, time to go to the slinger. And you're like, the slinger. Lord, I know I'm pushing you, but please don't let my neck hurt on the next one. Please don't let my neck hurt on this one, right? So I'm telling you, all I did was focus. At this one point, Sarah, we did this like Superman one where you lay like this, face down, and look at the ground that you could fall to your death. That's what you do is look down. Not me, because my eyes were closed and I was praying in tongues. That's all I did. So I, and finally, Sarah goes, Mom, she fixed you. I, you're not supposed to even move your neck to look at people, so I didn't know who was next to me who wasn't. Because all I did was say, Lord, please protect my neck, please protect my neck. So I just kept looking down, quiet, eyes closed, praying. And Sarah goes, would you open your eyes? I go, nope, focusing. I will not open my eyes. It was a combination of prayer and Lamont's breathing. <laughs> and you all, it was, I was pretty, I created a whole new thing there. But truthfully, I told my kids, I said, I think I've experienced a whole new a whole new um, physical experience with the Lord. It was like this euphoria. The combination of the speed, the speed, and really the um, the trying not to get nauseous because of the turkey leg I just ate from the other bit. Why do I eat the big turkey leg every time we go to one of these things? But in the car, I made it. Seven roller coasters and nothing hurt my neck. Okay? six hours to go home. Six hours still. If you don't know anything about theme parks, you're filthy when you're done with the theme park. You're all dirty, sweaty, and we have six hours. I was trying to talk Tommy into a $30 hotel just to do showers and then go, and he's like, nope, sanitize up. We're going home. All right. But here's the thing. This day at Six Flags, did we make a difference in eternity? Oh, heck no. Nothing that we did made a difference in eternity. But it did help me to see another bit of trusting God in everything. I literally was like, God, because I, I was like, I won't fear my neck hurting the rest of the day. I won't fear this. I'm like, Lord, you can keep my neck in place on the you do it. And he did. He did. Okay? It was trusting him. So we went to bed last night. We got home, took our showers, got into our nice cozy bed, and, and me and Tommy were just like, thank God this is such a great, and nothing, no pain, no anything. So this morning, it's about 6 a.m., and I got up to get my coffee, and I couldn't move. My neck was so stiff, and such pain, and I didn't know how to get out of bed. I couldn't move my neck, I couldn't move my body, and I was starting to get terrified and so I rolled my body out of bed and I was like I was struggling to get to the toilet to go to the bathroom and I was in horrid pain and all of a sudden I was so it was in so much pain I was getting nauseous and I got dizzy and the, my blood sugar I don't know blood sugar I don't know what it did but I felt like I was going to pass out and I yelled at Tommy and he's like and he came in and I said and I said this is spiritual I said, this is spiritual, pray for me. And, and I was down. How many of you know you never sit on your bathroom floor until you're ready to throw up? Right? And never 
put my face on my bathroom floor ever in my life. You ready to throw up? You put your face on your bathroom floor. I don't know why. But I literally was sitting on the bathroom floor and I, and I said to Tommy, I said, I have cold sweat. And he goes, I can feel that. And I said, pray, pray. And we just started calling on the name of Jesus. And I said, Satan, get out of my house in Jesus' name. And how many minutes, Tommy? Five minutes? I felt a cold sweat come over me and my body just, the pain went away. And I said, God's healing me. God's healing me. God's healing me right now. But I'm going to tell you, I said seven roller coasters and no pain. You can pray to God about anything. You can pray to God about anything and he's there. And we were saying it out loud. We were saying it. We were laughing. We had the best family time. So guess who creeped in? That ugly, ugly devil. And I, I knew, you guys, I was like, I will not. I had just written, I will not look at the common not look at the holy and call it common. I know this is holy. I know this is a su supernatural spiritual thing going on. God blessed us. Satan attacks you. You better cast him out and get back on track with God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cast him out. We took our authority. Tommy and I, we were yelling the name of Jesus. And I'm telling you, it was maybe five minutes of pain. And I am going to tell you, my neck it, it, it is the easy, easy, easy bit of of tight right now, okay? But nothing, nothing like what I woke up to. But I recognized, you guys, we have to recognize the spiritual. Yes. We have to recognize the spiritual. We can't just blame everything on coincidence or this or that. Recognize when Jesus is there. Recognize when the devil is there. Cast him out and get your eyes back on Jesus. Amen? Amen. Peter stepped out of the boat, walked on water, took his eyes off Jesus, started to sink. Jesus reached his arm in the water, pulled him out, and asked him why he doubted. Then they both climbed in the boat, and the word says, and when they climbed in the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you're the Son of God. Here's the key word I want us to hear here in verse 33. Then. Then the disciples worshipped and believed. Then meaning after they witnessed Jesus walking on the water. After they witnessed Peter walking on the water. After they witnessed Peter doubt and sink and Jesus pull him up. After they climbed in the boat, they believed and said, truly you're the son of God. Peter had the childlike, reckless faith Jesus was looking for. Peter had the faith Jesus wanted the others to have. Peter stepped out and trusted like a child. The others believed after they saw Jesus do the miracles. But John 20, 29 says, Then Jesus told them, Because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Y'all, I think about this morning, I could have just called it, oh great, it's the day after and my neck hurts. Nope. I knew it was spiritual. I knew the devil was watching me write my message in that car yesterday. I knew. If you do not know that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, if you do not know that we war not against flesh and blood, against principalities, evil spirits, and heavenly realms. If you do not know that we are in a spiritual war, you better wake up and realize that you have some fighting to do. Amen. Peter maybe didn't get it 100%, but I believe that the faith that Peter did have blessed and impressed Jesus a whole lot more than those that stayed in the boat and waited to make their judgment of who Jesus was when they saw him perform. Peter shows reckless faith. Reckless childlike faith. Reckless faith says, yes, Lord. Reckless faith says, tell me to come to you. 
Reckless faith says no matter what winds and waves may come, I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus and face forward. Reckless faith tells the questioning spirit of doubt to shut up. And reckless faith says, God has me. He's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. Reckless faith screams, I'm unforsaken. 